Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It is a bittersweet moment today. We should have been in our churches singing to our heart's content. No social distancing, no masks, no, what else have we been doing? No, not singing. <laughs> However, we are still online. Uh, some of us obviously are going to church. However, there were still restrictions in place. So I thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for choosing us to worship and fellowship today. I hope that the weather is better than the weather here. I'm hoping that it just won't rain. So we can go for a nice walk, you know, but we'll see. Sunny Birmingham isn't so sunny at the moment. <laughs> I will do a word of prayer and I'll get straight into our service for the end of the quarter today. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just so truly and grateful and thankful, Lord, um, that you have allowed us to reach the end of another week. Um, we know that there are so many obstacles that can get in our way and cloud our judgment, Lord, but I pray that you are in all things. Remind us to reach to you in all things. And as we partake in this service this morning, I pray that everything runs smoothly and I pray that we are also, also blessed by um, what we hear today. I pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Okay, let's get straight into the service. We're going to have song service, of course, start off with a little song. And today we are having Dylan do our song service. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Nondo Vega, and today it has been impressed on me to take us on a little story of God's love. And so when I think about God's love, I think about how it doesn't change. You know, despite everything that we do, despite everything that we promise not to do, it stays the same. And that's amazing to me. I mean, why wouldn't it be? You know, his love is not like ours. It has no boundaries. It's unconditional. And that is such a blessing to me. And so we're going to start off with a hymn that demonstrates his love through his grace before we even acknowledge it and when we don't even deserve it. And so I invite you to join with me as we sing the amazing grace.
has to be one of, if not the greatest display of love. And it's a display that still impacts us to this day. He loves you so much that he decided to pay the price. And so I'd like you to join me in Jesus Paid It All. your friends, your colleagues, what about them? Why not share with them this love that you have experienced and allow them the same opportunity of freedom? I pray that as you join me in this last song that your heart is impressed to tell someone about Jesus this week. And so join me in I Will Sing of Jesus' Love.
Amen. As you can all see, uh, that wasn't Dylan, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure we were all blessed by that beautiful singing today. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are reached, we have reached the end of this quarter. I hope that you have been enjoying this quarter. We've we did the Book of Romans um, at the start of the first quarter, and now we have been decoding the covenants. We are on week 13, the invitation. Please remember to join us on YouTube, give a little shout out, say hey. I'm happy to see everybody from different parts of the world. So very much want you to interact with us. Put your opinions down. I'm sure Craig will be monitoring YouTube and paying attention to everything. So, hey, everyone. I say everybody. As many people that can be on here today. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. It is good to see you. You look beaming and bright. The end of a quarter. Have you enjoyed it? Or is it just like you're happy to be over? Move on to the next one. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, Olivia. Thank you. So how's everyone doing? Mm, good, good, thank you. I think it's kind of between, but then, you know, a little bit not feeling well, but hey, I'm just blessed to be on the live stream this morning and discussing the highlights of this core. You know, it's interesting because we start and Olivia gives this explosive introduction, like, we're all, yes, we're, we're here. And then I'm like, how are you all doing? And it's like, mm, mm. <laughs> you know, look, praise God, it's Sabbath. Um, and that we're able to come together. I mean, look, I don't think anybody was still expecting to have to be here, but we are. And I think, I don't know what it's going to look like after possibly some type of hybrid type of worship situation but we have to give thanks that we're here there's a lot going on in the world all over the place and um, i'm just grateful that we are able to be here today we're looking at this um the last session for this quarter dealing on the covenants and it's called the invitation the invitation and um we delve into some of the words that jesus was sharing with the disciples you know um during that last supper and we're, we're here in this place now that we're going to talk about this but before we do begin um let's open with a word of prayer we'll read john chapter 15 verse 1 through to 17 um, but before we do read i've just got a short announcement that i need to make for everyone so that you can all um, know where we're heading over the next the rest of the year so i'm going to ask joel could you could you pray pray for us to begin please no problem let us pray <laughs> father in heaven we thank you for bringing us here to another sabbath day we thank you that we're all able to be here in the different places we are and i pray now as we enter this discussion father i pray that we will be encouraged father i pray that we will be receptive to hear a word from you and also i pray that you will guide and direct and govern this discussion um, as we learn more about this invitation. This is my prayer in your name. Amen. 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 So, you know, um, before I begin, it's been a fantastic time. I think we've had a great time together. There has been consistent inverse study from the time of lockdown right through to where we are now. And I just want to say, you know, publicly, Thank you. It's been fantastic working with all of you, um, serving, well, like saying working, I should say serving with all of you. Um, you volunteered your time consistently for a whole over a year now, weekly on Sabbaths, to dedicate that time to deliver a service to the young people of the NEC. So I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to Pastor Adam Ramden, um, as he's been leading the youth department um, and has allowed this opportunity for Inverse to happen. Um, while I'm not saying this is some type of exit speech and that we're finishing everything up and inverse is over, I'm not saying that. What we are saying is that things are going to be different from next week onwards as we enter into the new quarters. Inverse will now only be taking place on the on the NEC youth platforms anyway. Inverse will only be happening on the first Sabbath of every month. So that we will only be doing three lessons next month. Um, well, for next month, the month after, the month after that, 
along with three lessons for the whole quarter. We will be having the live sessions. This is across all platforms. So on uh, YouTube for the live sessions and Facebook for the Zoom sessions and also for Clubhouse, NEC inverse sessions will only be taking place on the first Sabbath of every month. Anytime that we come together to do the lessons, it will be an overview of what's happened during the month, our findings, our thoughts, and um, just the discussion for that study as well for that Sabbath itself. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, it's been great. This is where we're going to be going. We're transitioning. I'm encouraging you. Don't just stop because we're only doing one session once a month now. What we really, what we really want to see is that you're encouraged to take inverse to your Sabbath schools. There are some lo local churches that I know are running the inverse sessions. Jonathan, yours is one of them. Um, keep them going. This is something interactive. It's good for the young people of the church. It gets them involved, engaged in the lesson study. So I'm encouraging all of you for those other three or four Sabbaths of those months, don't just lie around and think, oh yeah, I can log on to the sermon later on now. No, no. Start an inverse session up in your church and let us know how it's going. Be proactive. Don't be reactive in this situation. Be proactive. Um, so if you're watching, we're encouraging you, start something up at your local church. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's let's get into the study for today. Shall we go? John chapter 15, verse 1 to 17. John 15, verse 1 to 17. Um, let's read. Let's read three verses each. I'll read the first three, and then we'll we'll go on all the way up to verse seventeen. So John fifteen verse one to seventeen. First three I'm reading. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse four, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, another as i have loved you verse 13 greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends ye are my friends and if ye do whatsoever i command you henceforth i call you not servants for this servant knows for the servant knows uh, not what the lord does but i called you friends for all things that i have heard of my father i have made known unto you Verse 16, um, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that ye love one another. All right, so as we, we, we look at this, What's the, what, what do you really get from the words that Jesus is saying? What, what stands out for you? It could be repeated words. The, the, what's gone in there? What, what he said to them? Bearing in mind that they're in this, this moment where he's about to get ready for the crucifixion. 
what, what's standing out for you with what's being said? Well, I have something to say about the scripture. I think that when he says that, like, he is the vine and we are the branches, what he's saying is, is like, we're God's children, we're his children. Generally speaking, that um, we're connected to him in so many ways that we can't even describe, you know, and as we do his work and tell the people who don't know about Jesus Christ yet, it's an amazing feeling that, you know, people can look at us and say, wow, you know, we're, you know, they're, they're, they're really disciples of God. They're, you know, they're standing up for Jesus. You know, I want to know more about him. Can you imagine how people would be like, okay, I want to go to heaven too. I'm, you know, I don't want to be in a sinful life anymore and all that, you know? Wow. So I think, I think it all comes down to discipleship in a sense. Like the more we, you know, help with Bible studies and all that, the more people would be like, okay, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. You know, I'm ready to, you know, be reborn. I'm ready to, you know, follow Jesus and follow whatever he calls me to do. So I think that's when, um, looking at the scripture just now, like he is the vine and we are the branches, you know, like bearing fruit. It, it generally means like we have to go tell the world who Jesus is. It's up to us to like do the job ourselves and tell others about Jesus Christ you know and this this okay. is just my point there all right thanks a lot janelle thank you um and it, ethan i think i saw your hand and then trafina um yeah I, I think i just appreciated the agricultural um kind of um i guess illustration that I, that christ uses and if you think about it you wouldn't get any fruit or rather there's no fruits that are produced from where the branches separate from the main um tree and so what it says there, verse five, um, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who does not, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Um, when I think of the fruits, I think of the fruit of the spirit. So if we're trying to be temperate, if we're trying to be loving, if we're trying to be um, gentleness and meekness, like we can't do those things unless we abide and we are attached to Christ. Um, if we were to do that, it would be in vain. Um, it would not be happening. Um, so for me, it just kind of reminded me that being connected. Yeah, um, basically the word like abide, abide, abide. And throughout the section, I just see like lots of relationships, like our relationship with the vine, our relationship with Christ as his disciples, but then also his relationship with the father. So it's like, as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So it's kind of like, I just see this network of vines and this network of love and this network of connection between the father and the son and the son and his disciples and the disciples and the fruits, everyone just being connected in this like really, really beautiful network of, of love, essentially. Mm, mm, I like that, a network of love. That's true. Thank you, Trafina. No what? Naomi, Naomi oh, and the okay. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Sorry. Thanks, Cersei. Um, I think just, um, yeah, the first thing that stood out to me as well, like Trafina, is the word abide. I think the invitation here from Christ is just for us to stay connected to him um, because he wants, he says, I haven't called you servants. He wants to be our friend. So wow. the whole point of us abiding is that we're therefore um, in a closer relationship with him that is like personal to us. And then what I like with that I think after it says that, um, it says you can then ask what you want and it will be given to you. And I think he can say that with confidence, not in the sense that we sometimes say, ask God for something and he'll give it to you. But he can say it because if we're abiding to God and we're friends, we will be in communion with each other. So what he wants for us, we're going to want for ourselves. So when I say, God, I want this thing that you want for me too, he's like, yeah, 100%. So I kind of like that connection as well like it's not just to stay close to him just for the sake of staying close to him but it then allows so many other things to come out of it and then I think my second point haha second point out three is that it says um it says that um da, 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 it says that you did not choose 
I chose you. So it's like, even in this, as we were kind of like speaking earlier, um, none of us chose ourselves to be here. I don't know, maybe some people volunteered. <laughs> but I think most of us were asked to be, to do this. Um, and I think it's the same thing, like just in general, wherever God has called us to be, um, he's the one who has chosen us to be there. And that always reminds me, even though when I don't always want to do something, I always feel inadequate to do something, that he has trusted me to be able to do that thing, whether it's because he wants to teach me something or there's something I'll be able to influence or whatever it is. Um, and again, I still need to stay connected to him so that I can fulfill that. It's one thing that he believes in me, um, but he's also doing that because he believes as long as I stay connected to him, he's going to give me every single step that I'm going to need. And my last point, I promise, is that these things I've spoken to you that you may, you, my joy may remain in you. And this week, I've got short testimony. It's been a busy week at work. I signed off to my devotion, then I kind of stopped. And then yesterday, I did it again. And then I had a better day yesterday than I had during the middle of the week. And then I remember I was talking to someone and I said, do you know what? I think I was really stressed about something. And then I was like, um, I think I have better days when I do my devotions. I think I've had a really bad week because I stopped doing my devotions midweek. And they're like, yeah, I think you handle things a lot better, actually, when you say you've done your devotion. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's so true. And so when I when, when somebody was reading that and I read it and I was like, oh, my days, it's so true. When we abide in him or his word abides in us, our joy can remain, like, through the good and the bad because he'll be giving us life in spite of whatever is happening around like you can see like I don't know if anybody's seen like sometimes images there's like one flower that is still standing and everything else is just falling apart <laughs> so it kind of just reminds me of that like as long as we stay connected around what's happening our job will be able to remain because he's given us life in spite of the circumstances around it. Mm. thank you great. thanks Naomi and then Mercy and then I'm gonna go on to one of our questions Oh, yeah. So I was just going to add on to the points that were actually said before. So I think the things that stand out for me was definitely the abide and the love. There's a lot of things that where Jesus is just repeating the word love. Um, just talking about the love between him and the father, the love between that we should have between our other uh, other people and how he's even claiming us as friends because he's like, because I love you guys. And um, I genuinely think like I definitely believe that all of it is being held together by the love idea. You can only abide somewhere if, you know, you've got a good enough reason. Like, I don't know, like with a, with a dog, I don't know if it's like the best example, but when you tell a dog to stay, the dog will listen to you because of the way the dog loves and sees you. And, you know, it's got a good enough reason to stay there. But if I told the doctor to say the dog probably ignore me because it doesn't know who I am, it's got, it's got no relevance in my life. So I think it's like the same thing here. Jesus is like everything that you're doing, the underlying theme and the underlying principle is love. And because we're friends, that's why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, online, I can see Destiny has said, abide, abide, abide. That's what stands out for me. So I'm going to say thanks. Thanks for that, Destiny. And um, yes, we are. I'm trying my best to make sure I can keep in line with what you guys are saying online as well while we're in this discussion um and again that's what's coming out abiding knowing god's will naomi you mentioned a point about calling um you know you've been called by god um i just encourage all of you to know what your individual calling in god is um it will save you i think sometimes a lot of headache when you know there's a theme or an idea that you take opportunities you make opportunities but when you know what god's calling you to do um when those opportunities come your way it's easier for you to identify yeah this is something i'm going to get involved in um in instead of saying yeah i'm going to just jump on everything and it will just help you know guide you along the path that you're walking with god so pray to god about what he's calling you to do what your mission in life with him is and it should be something that you actually take time to do. But abiding in Christ will help you do what God's calling you to do and not necessarily just what people are calling you to do. Because people will say, yeah, go and do this. Do Yeah, you should be doing that. Um, do what God's told you to do and don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of it. Um, so, yeah, we go on. Now, the, the 
first question, one of the main questions I've got is, why do you think bearing fruit is so important? It's mentioned in there, you know, we are abiding in Christ, bearing of fruit, but why is that even important? <coughs> Go I on, Joel. I think bearing fruit is, as I said, testament of true relationship with the Lord. Um, not just that the imp so what we just spoke about really is the invitation. The invitation is that Christ is saying, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to come basically come into your life, make things better, make you a better version of yourself, um, change things, give you a new way, a new perspective. So part of the invitation is yes, I want to do that work in you. But the invitation then is also that Christ wants us to be co-workers, co-laborers with him in completing the work that he has set us forth, set forth to do. Um, I want to share a text, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, really, <laughs> Christ wants everybody to know about him. He doesn't want anybody to not have an opportunity and he wants us to work with him in doing the work of telling others about him. Um, and so it's not just that abide in me is abide in me so that our relationship will be good. God wants us to have a good relationship with him, but also that it will affect our relationship then with those around us as well, so that we'll be able to lift them up, tell them about Christ and be able to, um, yeah, so that, because it's the Father's womb. He doesn't want anybody to not have that relationship. He wants everybody to do it. But the crazy thing that always blows my mind, Craig, is that he doesn't just do it himself, but he wants me and you to work with him in actually doing so. And that's the thing that always blows my mind. Christ actually is saying to each and every single one of us, work with me in this to also impact other people's lives as I've impacted yours. Mm. You know, you, you say it blows your mind, Joel blows your mind I'm, it blows mine too and i'm thinking you know why would he even use us to bear fruit it's not a rhetorical question i want some feedback um, yeah go on, go on mercy go on so yeah i was thinking just out to what joel was saying i think the reason why he could use us is because of the personal aspect that we can have with other people um obviously Jesus became human so that he could be relatable, but it, I guess we still always know that he's God. So the effect that we have on people when we're bearing fruit, it's we're like, we're changing the world sort of thing because I'm changing your life. You're changing someone else's life. Who's changing someone else's life? Do you know what I mean? So it's like um, in the knock on effect that we could have on others um, and the way that we can reach other people um, I think that's what God wants us to be able to experience. Um, and I also wanted to add to why bearing fruit is important. I think maybe it's important because um, it shows that there's a change in us, kind of like what Joel was saying before. But basically, the fruit doesn't come without Christ's intervention. So if anything, bearing fruit shows us that, you know, on the right track with God. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Joel, Joel. Janelle? <laughs> I'm just going to echo what Joel Merce was saying. Speaking of bearing fruit, there's a quote I come across while I was reading a devotion that's related to the inverse lesson from um, Ellen G. White from The Desire of Ages, page 641. She said that we are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. Coming across that quote spoke to me during the week, and I thought, wait a minute. That makes sense because this is why we bear fruit and this is why we try to change people's lives the right way in knowing Jesus Christ. Because once we do that, and she said it all, we are fitted for heaven. And there's a reason for that because we have heaven in our hearts. And once she means by that, it means that, you know, sometimes our life can be going back and forth and up and down. But we show that God is merciful, God is faithful, despite our circumstances, despite sometimes we have good days, and bad days. That's not going to stop us from bearing fruit. No. That's not going to stop us from discipleship. That's not going to stop us from experiencing God's love, you know? 
so many things so many things might you know might take us away from knowing god a lot more and having a deeper relationship with him through prayer and through morning devotionals etc i can i can tell you that the list goes on and on and on but the thing is is that you know we what we have to do you know let's put our distractions aside for you know aside for like a second and for a few minutes and then when we spend time with jesus christ you know that's when we know okay how we are fitted for heaven and that way okay we can bear bear fruit you know and tell people like i said earlier about who god is and that's just and that is what we're called to do this is why god calls us his workmanship his masterpiece in the first place according to ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. <coughs> thanks thanks a lot janelle now i see as well chido um trafina and naomi did you all want to say something yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. Chido, if you go first, then Trafina, then Naomi. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, reflecting God is literally why he created us, right? He made us in his image to be, like, expressions and extensions of his love. And when you look at a tree and think, okay, God is the trunk, <laughs> and we're, God is the main trunk that's like that, like, supplies all the nutrients and everything, and we are the branches... The trunk, the, the branches are like miniature versions of the trunk. They're part of the same thing. They reflect the trunk, but they're like miniature reflections of the trunk. And they're all different shapes and they reflect the trunk in different ways. And I mean, you know, speaking of the agricultural reference, which I love as well, I love the fact that God used this image of a vine and branches because when you look at a tree or when you look at a vine, the fruit doesn't grow on the trunk. It doesn't grow on the main spine. It grows on the branches. And if we read in um, John chapter 14, which is still part of the same sermon that Jesus was preaching to his disciples, um, John 14 and 15 are part of the same. If we read John 14, 12, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. So Christ is actually saying, I expect you to do what I did, in fact, to do even more. I expect the, the branches to bear the fruit. So Christ is literally expecting us to be a reflection of him and to do the bearing of the fruit. And it goes back to what Trifina was sort of saying about this network of love where God God wants us to almost extend and express and give out his love in this beautiful network. Um, so yeah, that's that's the point I wanted to make. No, I, 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 lo I love the, the thoughts there. Thank you, Chido, thank you. And then we've got Trafina and then Naomi. Yeah, I'll make it short. It's just going back to this word abiding. And when I think of the word abiding, it's like surrounding. It's something that's just in, out, left, right, around. And I don't know, I just thought of a bath. Um, so um, to me, like abiding in God, abiding in his word and his word is truth. I kind of picture being in a bath and having the best kind of like bubble bath, you know, coconut bubble wash that there is going. And your question was, well, why, why are we invited to, to go and bear fruit. Well, the angels haven't experienced the bubble bath that I'm experiencing. They haven't been in that water and they've, they've just not had it. Somebody else, even like, I can see Naomi on my screen. So Naomi, she's had a different bath experience, a different abide experience to mine. So she might tell somebody about the strawberry bubble bath, but I've got the coconut that can reach somebody else. So the reason why I think we're all invited and it's not just okay um yeah i'm gonna invite naomi but yeah trafina you can't come it's because we all have our own personal experiences we all have our own bath and our own abide that we've experienced and only we can get excited about it um so yeah i think it's it's like joel said it's a privilege to be called the invitation and we shouldn't see it as a chore but it will naturally pour out of us we'll naturally get out of that bath and say mom look at look at the coconut bowl bath and you know it's it's just that natural thing and it's we're we're told to model christ and if we look at christ i think he did active bearing or yeah active bearing and then there was just some like 
they're bearing like just naturally people will be like hmm what's that smell like coconut I, I like that and then you you share and you, it's your experience and sometimes Christ was like this is the word and people are like, oh I wouldn't have thought to ask that but now I get it so I think yeah it should just be a privilege um we shouldn't see it as a chore and we should be excited about just the natural abide experience that we've had and and share it with others to bear fruit yeah yeah, I, I, I just seen um, online, Chalaka just said, I like that analogy. So I think you're going to be getting a bunch of people getting their bubble baths, coconut flavor, <laughs> smelling whatever you want to call it. But then you get the brother that comes along and says, well, I'm having a shower, you know, and takes it to another sphere. And then you've got these other ones that jump on board. So thank you for that, Trafina. Um, I'm coming to you, Naomi. I just want to read points that have come up. Um, Destiny says, I think there is a blessing in partnership with Christ. We see a full manifestation of God's love, totally true. David Hanson Bartholomew says, um, Colossians 1 verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He desires us to follow his example, combining human and divine. Rodney says, fruit is evidence of God's working power in and through us. Totally agree with every single one of you. Um, Naomi. Yeah, that would just be a quick point. I think um, I find it really interesting. I think we've all already said the word abide, how that word that was chosen. He could have said, talk to me, pray to me, check up on me or whatever, but he said abide. And when I think of the word abide, it's probably, I don't know what the official definition is, but I see it as like stand by. Um, and that for me entails that Christ wanted us to I guess the other word is remain. That's what he keeps referring to. And I think in his mind, and I think this as well, that he knows that if we're not going to what he's called us to, we're not bearing fruit, it's a lot harder for us to abide. Um, And this is kind of what we see in the New Testament as well. Like in Hebrews, it's like, make sure you're encouraging one another, exhorting one another daily, checking up on each other, because it's really hard to be a Christian on your own. And it's really hard to abide, remain, stand by without, sh- like, without reminding yourself of what <clears throat> for you before, without sharing with other people his love. It's like, when I share, I'm reminding myself of who God is, what he's done for me, where I'm going. And so I think it was kind of, not written but it's also saying you need to <laughs> that, like <laughs> you need to actually go to where I'm calling you to because this will also sustain you to be able to stand by and remain and con- and enjoy till the very end so definitely definitely I thought I'd just look up abide while you were saying it Naomi abide means to accept or act in accordance with a rule decision or a recommendation so abiding in Christ, I mean, this is a dictionary version. I'm sure that there's the, the Greek understanding for the word itself as well. Mm. But it means to, to act in accordance with what God's told us to do. And Jesus is abiding me. Now, Clem, I see your hand. I just want to make a quick point before we move on, just to kind of bring a, a short summary. Um, we're told to abide in Christ so that we can we can give fruit. Now, can I see the hands of you? Who would, would if, if I had a bunch of fruit right now, who would take a strawberry? Can I see your hands? All right. Who, who would take a mango? What are, the, what are the other options? I need all the options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a mango, there's an apple, there's a pear, there's a banana. You're not all going to take the same fruit, right? Because you've got a desire for maybe one specific one. Um, abiding in Christ and bearing fruit to the world. We're talking, we're dealing with, different people who have different needs, who are going through different struggles and are just on totally different journeys to each other. But the fruit that God told us that we can provide by dwelling in him should have every single one of them realize, I have something that meets your needs, Christ, and making that available to the people. I think it's one of the challenges that we have as a Christian because at times we... We encourage people to participate of what we've got to offer. But then there are times when we push people away. And it's how do we how do we pull people to us? Just a, that's a rhetorical question. We're not going into that discussion. But it's something to think about. How do we pull people to participate in this fruit, which ultimately comes from Christ, which is really needed from it's needed by all of them. 
everybody. Um, so Clem, I'm going to take your point and then we'll move on. Okay. I'm just going to quickly say that, um, you know, having listened to everyone, the, 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 the concept I want to bring out is that everyone bears fruit because we are either bearing good fruit or bad fruit. And I say this because when you read the New Testament, for example, when we read the book of Galatians chapter chapters five, chapter five, verses 19 down to 23, and verses 19 down to 21 talks about the bad fruits, talks about the fruits of the flesh, you know, adultery, fornication, witchcraft, hatred, you know, strife and the rest. And then it comes down to talk about the fruit of the spirit. So we are bearing fruit in one way or the other. So if you're not bearing fruit for God, then you are ultimately bearing fruit for Satan. But again, when you read the book of Luke chapter 15 verses, uh, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 13 verses 6 to 9, uh, Jesus talks about the, the frustration of the barren tree. Uh, so whilst we could bear good or bad fruit, it also suggests that we may be barren. And then the frustration is that God has done every single thing he could to make us fruitful to make us productive but yet we are still not bearing any fruit and then there gets to be a point where god says you know what i have no choice but to cut this tree down and i say that because it's important we bear fruit because when you read revelation ultimately we will be judged by the kind of fruit we bear. So it is not just something in your heart and you say, you know what, I am bearing fruit and nobody can see my fruit. By our behavior, by our outward appearance, we are showing what kind of fruit we bear. Because the Bible is very clear. We will be judged by the kind of fruit that we bear. Uh, there is no middle ground here. It's either you're bearing fruit for God or you're not bearing fruit for God, and there is no middle ground in this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that. It's a true point as well. Um, I'm going to read Romans chapter 6, verse 20 to 22, and then we look at the type, why? Why we really need to bear this fruit? Uh, because it's something that all of us, um, it's, a, it's a revelation of what all of us strive with. So Romans 6, verse 20 to 22, Paul says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Um, what, fruit, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, <clears throat> you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. So really what we're showing the world is the fruit that I've got, that I, I have to share, is one where you can have freedom from sin and have everlasting life. And that's really the thing that we need to hold on to. We can be set free. Um, people are often thinking, impossible, I can't let go of the struggles I'm going through. But I just want to encourage everyone, you can be set free and you can make the right choices in life. Um, against all of the voices that will tell you you can't through the power of christ i'm persuaded I'm, i fully believe with my whole heart that you can make the right decisions in life and be set free from sin fully believe it or else god wouldn't have said it god wouldn't have said that um ethan you mentioned you shall be you shall know them by their fruits matthew seven twenty. was there anything that you wanted to say on that before we move on to the next question no, no, no. I was just um, saying what Clem says, because when you think about trees, they grow outward. They don't, you, know, you never see hidden trees. Um, yeah. You know a tree by its fruits. Wow. Excellent, excellent. Okay, then. So the next question is, you know, we're, <laughs> we're in this walk with Christ. Um, and every day, there seems to be the desire to do something new with God. God says that he has a new blessing for us every single day. Um, I'd hope that we could say that we've taken hold of the blessings that he's had for us, the blessing he had for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But sometimes some blessings are held in suspension because we're not doing the practical things to, to actually experience God. So I'm asking now, what practical steps should we take to abide in Christ? What are the practical things we should do? Mercy, your hand went up quickly. Go on. 
Oh, I've been looking forward to this question. <laughs> so um, I wanted to say, <clears throat> Pastor David Asterik has a message that he shares about abiding. And the way he describes it really stood out to me. He says it's like staying. Basically, God wants us to stay and continue doing what it is we're doing. Not trying to switch things up and trying to get creative and be like, oh, you know, let me show you something different that I can do. God's like, no, the actions you're doing now continue in those actions. So there's a couple of verses that I was going to bring up. Um, there was like Matthew 16, 24. Um, you know, the, the, um, the instructions that Jesus tells us to do, like taking up our cross and following Christ in denying um, ourselves and following Christ. Um, and, um, you know, the, the sufferings and the things that we have to go through and basically all the little things that Jesus tells us to do and the understanding and the knowledge that we have for Christ, the zeal and the passion that we have, even these studies that we've just had where we're learning about the covenant, the way our eyes have been opened and you know the excitement that we're getting and all of this kind of thing, this is what Christ wants us to stay in. He wants us to stay in this um, state of mind, this, this energy level, because when we try to start switching things up and changing it and being like, okay, you know, I've had enough of this. I think, I think I'm sorted on the Christian front. Let me go and try, I don't know, something completely different that Christ hasn't told me to do. That's when we start to make errors. That's when our fruit starts to, you know, become a bit defective. So mm, abiding oh. is basically just stay, continue doing what you're doing. Yeah, I love that. Staying and doing, continue doing what you're doing. Um, there's also an element of doing more of, you know, while you're doing what you're doing, it strengthens you to do more. Like you learn how to do something. Then there's the next stage that he'll take you to, to, to learn something new with him as well, um, without switching things up, if you get what I mean. Um, so how, what's your day like? <laughs> you know, there's several of us here right now. What is your day? Like? How do you practically abide with him? What do you do? Yeah, so... Right, well, yeah. Oh, yeah, go on, Jonathan. I was waiting because I was, I, I was thinking people don't... Maybe we just don't wake up. Maybe we just uh, awake the whole time. We don't... <laughs> you know, go on, tell me. What do you do? Yeah, so I was just going to say, like, some of the practical steps and what I do personally. So, obviously, like, a part of the interconnectedness is, obviously, like, abiding in Christ is about, like, spending time in his word. Um, it's about praying, um, and I think like when, you, when I think of prayer as well, my, my prayer life has changed quite a bit in terms of it's not always a case of me actually getting down like on the floor and, you know, putting my hands together like the formal act of prayer. Um, but I've realized, I guess, through studying, through you know, just like just, just experience in general that like sometimes, you know, the Bible says we've got a secret place. Oh. Um, so all throughout the day, um, I'm, I'm communing with God, essentially. Um, so, you know, like a problem pops up at work or, you know, something happens with my friends or something happens in a relationship. I said, Lord, like, please help me or because the Bible says we've got a secret place. Um, so it's not just the case, not in the not just in the formal act where we're actually getting down on our knees, but also in our in our minds. We've got a secret place where we can continually and consistently commune with God. So I've kind of found that that's helpful. And that's how I um, like remain like abiding in Christ, like you're saying. All right. So, Jonathan, you, you mentioned you could be at work and something comes up. Let's, mm -hmm. You know, some of us are working right now we're, or we may be studying or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're in a situation, you've got a colleague who's talking to you and then the Holy Spirit impresses you. You need to talk to me about this right now because it seems we're talking about prayer. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? Like, how do you how do you navigate through that moment? Tell, tell us practically what do you do at that moment if it happens? Well, sometimes it's literally just like a quick, sometimes it's not even a case of all of the words coming out. Sometimes it's literally in your mind, like, Lord, like, help me. Or sometimes it's literally just Lord. Um, and like, I know there's a, there's a text in Romans that says that um, the Holy Spirit, um, you know, with groanings that cannot be muttered. So, so the Holy Spirit often interprets like what we're going through. Um, and I think that's just powerful, really. The fact that like, you don't even actually, you don't even actually have to speak it but God ultimately knows what you're going through and he's able to intervene in that moment um, and I've seen that in loads I could share loads of testimonies but you mm. can't hear like all day so can you imagine when we get to heaven and the angels saw you say heard you say Lord and they're like all he said was Lord and the Holy Spirit will actually 
Yeah. What he said was, da, 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 and they're like, okay, <laughs> okay. Oh, wait for that. Oh, wait. All right. So we've got that. So we've got prayer. Anybody else want to talk about their experience in these moments? Yeah, Joel, go on. Trefina, did you have your hand as well? <laughs> All right, Joel, Joel, and then Clem, and then Trefina, if you've made up your mind, come in. I think it's just always finding time. Uh, the best days I have are the days where devotion don't get skipped. So <laughs> when I woke up on time um, and the devotions I've been doing right now have been very powerful. I've been learning a lot. Um, but the best days are the ones where devo I find time um, and sometimes I'll be cutting it a little bit fine. I'll be like, do you know what? I'm going to go do my devotion anyway. Um, I'm going to try and make this the rest of my morning sort of work around that, even though I've woken up a little bit late. And then the best day is really when I set myself up with the right thought. Um, and it, it helps me go with God throughout the day. I start the day with God. And what I really try to do, though I always sometimes do struggle because I live a very busy lifestyle. First thing on the morning, it has to be that. Before we reach for the phone, before we think about anything else that's going on, before we speak to that friend or the, anyone else, it has to be that. You have to start with that. It's prioritizing God. God, you're number one. Everybody else and everything else comes second to you. And so maintaining that, uh, when you, last thing on the night, make sure you speak to your creator, find time um, to settle your mind before you go to sleep and let that be that. And so I find when I get myself into that routine, it really, really helps. Um, and also then just finding time, you know, you have to know when you have to take yourself away. Jonathan spoke about being in a secret place. And sometimes you have to know when you need to find time for that during the week. If you've not had a good week, find time Friday. And that, that's the beauty of the Sabbath and why we, we can use the Sabbath. Um, Sabbath is amazing for me because it doesn't matter what kind of week I've got. Sunset on Friday, every, it doesn't matter how things are going. It doesn't matter what deadlines I've got to get through. It doesn't, it, the, everything could be happening I'm spending those 24 hours in communion with God. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how things are going. And I always find I'm refreshed. I always find that maintains um, my relationship. And one more thing, music. Oh, yeah. Music. I cannot, I cannot say more than, I cannot express enough um, how impactful it is listening to spiritual songs throughout the day and throughout the week. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get into a full discussion about what we should and shouldn't listen to, but I'm, I'm going to say this. Spiritual songs do far more for me than any other type of music will ever do. Um, and so there are times when they are the only thing that will do for me. Nothing else can really, I, I need, I need something, I need to be reminded that God loved me. I need to, I, I, I need something spiritual. And so I go to these songs throughout the week um, at different times where the week's going up and down and it helps sustain me. Uh, whether that's sitting down at the piano or just or just listening, and it really helps um, maintain my relationship with the Lord. Joel, just before I come to Clem and then maybe Trefina, I want to know. Um, you mentioned two points that I just I just want to ask you about devotion, morning devotion. Do you stick in the same devotion uh, topic, or do you change it change it up every maybe few days or something? Um, well, what do you do for devotion? How do you deal with it regarding topics, themes, or whatever you're going through? All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you all in a little bit into what I do for my devotions. My devotions will start with a song. Um, one, at one time, what I was doing, I was singing through the entire hymn book, um, just the songs that I knew because I didn't have time to learn new songs in the morning. Um, and so I, I would sing, and that, you know, um, and White makes a quote that singing is as much an act of worship as prayer. And, and, I, and that often is my prayer. And I, I find songs and I sing to the Lord in the morning, those songs, um, whether it's softly and tenderly, whether it's I will follow thee, my savior. I find something that really will pull me close um, and I'll, I'll sing. Um, no one will ever hear that. I'm not a singer, amen, I play the piano. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll sing. And then what, what will happen is in terms of topics, I've actually got devotional that I'm going through. Um, it's telling me about the history of the church. It's called Lest We Forget by George R. Knight. Um, and it's taken, uh, every day I'm getting in-depth stories, uh, in-depth stories about how we went through um, tithing, how tithing came into the church, how we got organized, the Sabbath, all these different things sort of came in. Um, and so that's sort of my topic for the year. It's a year devotional. Other times I've done different topics and stuff. Um, but at, at current, that's what I'm going through. It's called Lest We Forget. And it's given me yeah, we'll probably have to sit down and have a conversation about that, Craig, because there's some things to talk about. But that's what I'm doing at the moment. 
Yeah, no, I think I appreciate that. Cause I mean, you made a statement that I've never really considered in in the context of what you've just mentioned it there that you know uh, singing or or music is as much as praise as or prayer. I can't remember. Active worship as prayer. As is prayer. Yeah, I'll find the quote for you. Mm, mm, mm. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clem. Clem. Okay, um, just because we're running out of time, I'm just going to go straight to the point. Um, on, on, on the practical basis, what I think about uh, how to stay um, abiding in Christ is we need to remember that abiding is a painful process because uh, for two things to abide in each other, one of them, in fact, both of them has to be cut. You know, so, you know the, when you think about the agricultural implication, you have to cut the, the branch that you're trying to stick into in one, you have to cut both of them and fit that in. So it is a painful process. So when God wants us to abide in him, he has to cut us in one way or the other. So there are things in our lives that God needs to cut off. And then when I think about, I think it's in, let me just quickly check in Romans chapter 11, verse 22, he says, behold, therefore the goodness and the severity of God. So the goodness and the severity of God, they go hand in hand. So God is good to us at the same time, God can appear to be harsh to us. So those cherished things, those cherished addictions, those things that we enjoy doing that we know are not good for us, God needs to cut them off our life. And then if you go towards the end of Romans chapter 11, verse 22, it says, if thou continue in his goodness, it says, otherwise thou shall be cut off so god expects us to continue in him so abiding in him is not an on and off relationship where today you know what i feel like i want to abide in god and then tomorrow then when i don't feel like you know i disconnect myself and i go do what i want to do and i come back and reattach it does not work it's got to be a permanent relationship it's got to be continuous now remember it is a painful process sometimes but ultimately it will result in good for us especially um, when we stay connected in God. Mm, I love that. I love that, Clem. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, I, before I tell you, Jonathan, Trefina, are you coming in? I'm coming in. I'm coming in. Right, coming in. So I'll tell you, after you, Trefina, I'm going to take Jonathan, then Chido, then I'm going to sum up, and then we'll close. Trefina. Yeah, I'll be, and practically, I, um, I'm not a morning person, but I, I do read and pray in the morning. I find that ending the day with God as well is really important. So recently I've been reading a page like of a book every night. And um, now it may seem like it's going to take me a year to get through the books that I'm reading. However, most nights I read more than a page, but in my mind, I have to read a minimum of a page and just soak everything from that page, whether I'm reading Patriots and Prophets or some books on the, the life of Christ. And mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of books that I'm reading, um, but I just read something each night, highlight, pull, Bible text. It's kind of like a, a nighttime devotion, um, which has a slightly similar format to the morning devotion. But I think morning devotion is important, but also like close off that day with God um, as well. And it, I just found it kind of collects the day. It's kind of like a debrief for the day. I kind of get ready for the night, relax, let things go. Um, so yeah, if you're um, having morning devotions, I think also try and do something in, in the night as well before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Trafina, I just want to come back at you on something. I think what you've said is powerful. The, you, you know, you've selected a page, just a page, but you often do more than a page. Why didn't you, did you select a page because it's something that you know you can definitely do and you'll possibly go over it instead of saying, I'm going to do 10 pages and then you only end up reading two. Why, why, why a page? I think the page was because it didn't seem like daunting. It was like, like of course you can read a page um but it's kind of like the depth of that page so when I started it I was reading Desire of Ages and um I've got like the last three chapters to read and I was like I, I really want to get through this but in my head I'd been setting chapters in a day and I couldn't get through the whole chapter because I was reading like pulling apart highlighting quoting and there was just too much happening so I was like a page can be done um and yeah a page because it seemed manageable and um, so I'd say maybe something practical don't set unrealistic things like don't say I'm going to wake up at 4am and spend three hours with the Lord like 
yeah pre some preachers say you know that 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 time in the battle room before you go out like I don't know there's a quote like how many hours in prayer or the more hours in prayer the busier the day the more hours in prayer you spend something like that um but yeah if if you not if you don't have that time but if you're just starting out don't set a, a target that is too far distant I would say Thank you, thank you. And that will also help with people not feeling guilty for not reaching their target. So thanks, yeah. thanks for that. Jonathan and then Chido, and then I'll close on those points. Yeah, so I was just going to say, like, I think one of the things that um, the life of Joseph kind of teaches is that we can't blame not abiding in Christ um, yeah. on circumstance. Like, we, we can't say that, oh, because of the circumstance, I'm not abiding in Christ, or because of the circumstance, I'm not being fruitful. Because when you look at um, Genesis 49, verse 22, um, the Bible actually says that Joseph was a fruitful son. Um, and, you know, when you look back through the life of Joseph, you know, in Potiphar's house, um, he prospered. He was fruitful. Um, even in a jail cell, um, he was fruitful. Um, and then ultimately, like when he became like the leader of Egypt, he was incredibly fruitful um, in that period of time as well. So we can't blame circumstance. And say that, you know, um, because of circumstance, I can't abide in Christ. Oh. Um, God, like heaven has given us literally all the opportunity um, to be able to abide with him. He's given us like his word. He's given us like prayer, the secret praise. Um, he's given us um, his spirit. Um, so we can't blame circumstance. And, and the life of Joseph kind of illustrates that. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Chido, last point. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say like, we get a really practical breakdown of what it, what it means to abide in Christ from the rest of the sermon. So I, I, I encourage everyone to read everything that Jesus said in that block because he really breaks it down before he then sort of wraps it up into this, you know, vine and branches metaphor. So in, in chapter 14, verse 23, he says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. Um, so, you know, spending time in God's word and also recognizing that the word of God is is an organic whole. So we mustn't, you know, pick and choose only the bits that we're comfortable with. We need to spend time in all of his word and understand what God's will is for our life. Um, and then in 14 verse 15, it says, if anyone loves me, they'll keep my commandments. And um, John 15 verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So we see this connection between abiding in love, bearing fruit and keeping God's commandment. All of, all of that is part of abiding in Christ. Um, in verse 12 um, of chapter 14, it says, he who believes in me, the works that I, will, that I do, he will do also. So Jesus expects anyone who believes in him to carry on his work in the world. He, he doesn't expect us to just, you know, keep it all, keep it all in. There is, there is a work of ministry to be done. And then finally in verse 16, and there's, there's loads more, but um, 14 verse 16, um, Jesus acknowledges that like none of these things are easy or natural for us to do and that we need, uh, we need help. So he, he promises to send another helper. He says, I will give you the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will abide in us. So listening to the Holy Spirit's guidance and entreating is a really, really key power and a key part of us abiding in Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for those points, Chido. Um, all of the points that have been mentioned are important. I think that they cover the four main points of being practical with Christ. We call them habits of grace, prayer, study, finding that quiet time, and commitment, obedience to God. Um, so let's make our best to do that. And I plead with you all, accept the invitation of Jesus Christ to come to him. He's the, the all, the be all of our life. Um, if you don't know him, get to know him is, is great. Um, you won't see him until he comes when his return is. But I'll wrap up for Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was going to say that you won't see him until he comes. Um, but 
Oh, are you still there, Craig? Okay, I think we've lost him. I think. But um, yeah, I think he was going to say the invitation. The invitation is that Christ is inviting us all and each individual yeah. to have a deeper relation. Oh, you back? Go ahead, Craig. Sorry. No, Joel, you were saying exactly what I was trying to say. My, it came up on my screen. Internet connection unstable. Ah, listen, you're going to see Jesus Christ when he returns. But you, you know, just you get what I'm saying. He's coming back and make your experience with him uh, practical. Don't try to do what everybody else is doing. Do you in God. Let him have, have an experience with him. Make it personal. Let's let's pray and then uh, mm-hmm. we'll close. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your loving kindness and your mercy. We thank you for the time that we've had with you over the past year. Um, well, more than a year. And as we're transitioning, I pray that you help us to consider and to walk with you daily. Um, inverse, the methods are changing on what we'll be doing on the live streams, but um, you're still here, Lord. You are still consistent. You are following through with everything that you said you would. Help us to follow through with what we said we will do with you by your strength, because we can't do it alone. So we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Amen. Just to remember, all of you watching, Inverse will now be the first Sabbath of every month. First Sabbath of every month. The other Sabbaths, get involved in your local churches and start an Inverse program at where you are. Olivia, please don't tell me after going over time. Um, you have to forgive me because you're a Christian. So God bless you all. <laughs> What's going on? I said five minutes. This yeah, I know. I I know. Craig, this is why I said five minutes. You said be six. You're being cheeky, Craig. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. The Sabbath, you know, forgiveness and all that. In my spirit, the Lord. <laughs> uh, but no, excellent study. Such a fruitful study. You made some really wonderful points, guys. Like you said, habits of grace and listening to the Holy Spirit and starting where you're at. And Jafini, he said, um, not setting unrealistic expectations of yourself. And sometimes we do, we compare ourselves to others. Like, oh, he's doing that and she's doing that. Like, it's so important. Like he said, just to start where you're at, start small and you work your way up. So really fruitful study. Thank you so much, guys. Happy Sabbath. Have a good day. Sabbath, God bless you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. I hope you are still with us. I hope you enjoyed such a fruitful study. The end of this quarter has been finished. The next quarter, I mean, I'm not sure. I had a look and it was um, something on sexuality. I don't know. This is what I saw. You you might want to have a look yourself on the Inverse Study website. Please log in, um, have a look, study with us for next week. We are on next week, but we won't be on Uh, the weeks after that so just the first week of um each month is that we'll be doing from now on rather than every week but thank you to those who have been with us earnestly every week um contributing um and just connecting with us even if it's in your living room you're having discussion with your family um that is connecting we can't see you we can't hear you but we know god is with you and and god hears you so we thank you for that but yes next week they'll move on to a, a brand new topic on the Inverse website, I believe. And I think, like I said, it is on uh, sexually designed principles of the Bible. So biblical sexuality, you take that as you want to take that. (laughs) So we will now uh, have our youth spot and I think it's our health spot, sorry, our health spot and that's by Shade Henry, I believe. Hi NEC youth, I'm Dr Jade and I'm going to be doing your health spot today. Um, we're going to be talking about something that is really relevant during this season um, and something that you probably heard other people talk about during this pandemic that we find ourselves in and that is depression. Um, there have been unfortunately record um, numbers of people suffering from depression during this time and I think it's really important as Christians that we understand it for ourselves and our own community community within the church and also for a wider community, our friends, our family who may not share our faith um, so that we can be a support to them. Um, So what is depression? Depression is defined as persistent low mood or a lack of interest in things that you formerly found enjoyable. Um, And depression is caused by many different things. So there's a number of factors that play into the causes. We think it's a a combination of uh, chemical imbalances in the brain. Um, So differences in the neurotransmitters in your brain, uh, stresses, environmental factors, genetic factors. Some people are more prone genetically to suffer from depression. So all these things play into it. 
I think one of the most important things to know about depression is that it's a medical diagnosis. So it's something that's diagnosed by a medical professional. Um, I would advise that if you have any of the symptoms of depression, such as low mood, persistent irritability, uh, sleep disturbance, thoughts of self-harm or suicidal ideation, that you see a medical professional and get a diagnosis for it. Um, one of the things to remember about depression is that it's not your fault. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not something that you should try and fix by yourself. Many of the Bible characters that we admire, like Elijah and David, they struggled with what we would now call depression um, and they were used mightily by God. So it's really important to remember that. So there are four simple tips um, that I have in terms of managing with depression. So the first one is, as I said, go and see your GP. Make sure that you're plugged into a medical professional, that you get a diagnosis and that you're following advice from your medical professional. Um, they can provide you with um, referrals to counselling or talking services. They might also suggest that you take some medication and some Christians struggle with the idea of taking medication for depression because we feel that we're uh, saying that we're not relying on God to provide us joy or to, to give us the fulfilment that we need. But I would um, implore everybody to think about it just like any other illness. If you're, you're, you had a broken leg, you'd go to A&E and get it fixed by a doctor. If you had a, an infection that wasn't getting better, you would use antibiotics. And it's, it's not really any different with depression. Um, if you need medication, it's not a sign of weakness. It's something that's there that God's provided for you to use. The second thing is engaging in community. It's really important um, that we have community around us. And with depression, it can be really tempting to isolate yourself. Um, I would encourage you to, even if it's having one friend that you can talk to um, regularly or somebody that you feel that you can trust, um, I would especially recommend getting therapy or, or attending counselling if you need to. It's good to have an impartial professional who can actually help you work through um, <clears throat> your low mood. Um, but attending church services or being part of the youth group is a really useful way of, of having support during that time. The third thing is having a healthy lifestyle. So your diet, your exercise, your sleeping patterns, they all play into... Um, how your mood is. We're doing a lot more research now that suggests that there's a, a strong connection between our gut and our brain and that what we eat actually affects our moods. So there's evidence that having um, a diet rich in leafy green vegetables and that's plant-based actually boosts some of the hormones in our brain that um, help with having a, a positive uh, mood. Um, also that a high carbohydrate diet boosts something called tryptophan in our brain, which again supports a healthy mood. And then sleep. Sleeping can be really difficult. If you suffer from depression or anxiety or low mood, you'll know that it can be very difficult to sleep. Um, so don't beat yourself up if you're not getting enough sleep. Um, again, go to your GP. Um, they can support you in, in, in finding better sleep hygiene habits. And for some people, they might require a short course of drug medication to help them support their sleeping patterns. Um, but again, exercise again plays into that. Having exercise, regular exercise when you can, um, trying to be motivated even with a friend if you feel like you can't motivate yourself can really help support your sleeping pattern and your mood. And the fourth thing, which is probably one of the most important things, is connecting with your father. Um, your father in heaven knows you better than anybody knows you. Um, and he saw this in your future. He knew if you were going to be suffering from low mood. Low mood um, and he knew the resources that he was going to provide for you to help you during this time. Um, so be honest with God, be open with God about how you're feeling. Um, and connect with him in prayer. Don't feel ashamed or embarrassed. Um, some of, as I said, some of the mightiest people in the Bible suffered with this as well. Um, and it's really important that we have an, an environment that doesn't have any stigma to having depression. It's something that lots of people struggle with and there's lots of help available for you. So be blessed, be encouraged and have a happy Sabbath. Amen. Amen. As Sade said, it's so important to get the help that you need. Prayer is wonderful. But pray and do. See, seek somebody. Get the help. Don't be ashamed. We all get very overwhelmed um, by a lot of things that can happen in life um, that are very stressful. Um, and you not necessarily don't know how to, to handle it, to, to deal with it. Get the help that you need. Thank you, Sade. We will now go into our divine service and start off with a wonderful, wonderful prayer by our wonderful and beautiful Melissa. <laughs> Good morning, Olivia. Good morning, everyone. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Heavenly Father, God, you are our rock and you are our salvation. God, we take refuge in you and we thank you so much, God, for being our defence, God, and being our hiding place. Father, 
Great is your faithfulness towards us, Lord. We would lose count of the numerous ways just this week that you provided and sustained us, Father. We're so grateful. Lord, we come with hearts full of thanksgiving because your mercy and your grace towards us has been so consistent and yet so undeserved, God. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for where we have fallen. Father, help us not to fall in the same places again. We ask us, God, that we are able to abide in your word, Lord, through the power of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we also bring before you this morning the leaders, not only of our church, God, but of our country. Lord, this week has been a little wild, but Lord, we place them in you, Lord, because actually it's in you that we put our trust, Father, our confidence is in you. Who do we have in heaven but you, God? Men are weak and men are erring, Heavenly Father, even the very best, Lord, but you promise in your word that you will provide wisdom liberally to those who ask. So we're seeking on their behalf this morning, Father, that you'll provide them with wisdom to lead with confidence, wisdom to lead with humility, Father, wisdom to lead with a surrender to a higher power, Lord, which is you. Lord, we ask, God, that you would be with them and that you would guide them, Heavenly Father. We pray also, Lord, for our work colleagues and also for our family members, those who are of faith and those without. Lord, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would cause your light to shine so brightly in us that they would they would see that light and glorify you, our Heavenly Father. Help us to bear fruits of righteousness, Lord, so that they will be drawn to you, Father. May we be hidden and Christ be glorified, Lord. Bless them, Lord, and do amazing things that they cannot help but turn to you and say, wow, there must be a God in heaven. Father, we pray, Lord, and finally for our speaker, Nuri, this morning, Lord, we pray that your word would go forth with power. Lord, you know the areas of our lives where your Holy Spirit needs to quicken and convict. God, we pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would speak to each and every one of us, Lord, that though the words come from his mouth, the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts individually, Lord, and may, may we leave change, Lord, and walking closer to Jesus. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for opening our divine hour. Have a good day. We are now moving on to our tithes and offerings. So the slides should come up on the screen. You know the drill. You know how it goes. We have three options. We've got an online donation that you can make at www.nec.adventist.uk forward slash contact us slash donate. And just make sure that you put the purpose of your offering either tithe to the NEC or offering to uh, your local church. You can make a bank transfer and the bank is NatWest and the sort code is 608009. And the account number is 84598816. And again, just put your name and your church and just tell us the nature of your donation today. And of course, option three, uh, you can make a, a transfer via PayPal, uh, which is quick, easy and simple on the BUC email and that is give at adventist.org.uk so I'll give you some time to write those things up and I'll give you just a short extract from my devotional this morning and this is entitled the gift of tears and it's taken from John 11 verse 32 to 44 and it says I called a longtime friend when his mother died she had been a close friend of my mother and now both had passed on as we spoke, our conversation slipped easily into a cycle of emotion, tears of sorrow that Beth had gone and tears of laughter as we recalled the caring and fun person she had been. Have you experienced that strange crossover from crying one moment to laughing the next? It's amazing that sorrow and joy can both provide a physical release. Since we are made in God's image, Genesis 1 verse 26, and humour is such an integral part of almost every culture, I imagine that Jesus must have had a wonderful sense of humour. We know that he also knew the pain of grief. When his friend Lazarus died, Jesus saw Mary weeping and said he was deeply moved in spirit. A short time later, he too began to weep. Our ability to express our emotions with tears is a gift and God keeps track of each tear we cry. I personally <laughs> can go from laughing one in one breath and cry the next and vice versa and we are grateful and thankful to God that he allows us to be able to express ourselves 
um, through tears. And I don't know about anybody else, but after a good cry, I feel so much better and I sleep well that night too. <laughs> so the gift of tears, don't forget, um, God has given you that gift um, to be able to express your emotions in whatever way that you need to. So we are thankful for that. Hopefully that has given you enough time to write the details down. Before we hear from our preacher uh, for today, we will now have a meditational item. Soon as 
story How I made it over Oh, I'm going to put on my robe And tell the story How I made it over Oh, I'm going to put on my robe Tell the story how I made it over Oh, soon as I get home Oh, soon as I get home Amen. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you for leading that meditational item. Your voice is always soothing. So I will invite our preacher for today on. Um, if you don't know this person, I didn't know who this person was. I'm very, very sorry until today, which is why I messaged you <laughs> this morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Nuri, is it? Yeah, yeah that's right. That's good. That's good. Nuri, yes. okay. Happy Sabbath. You're okay. Yes, thank you. Happy Sabbath. So for those like me who aren't sure who Nuri is, he goes to Manchester South Church. Uh, he lives in Manchester. You live in Manchester. You mm -hmm. work in digital marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. You are married with one wife, I hope, oh. and <laughs> three beautiful children. And you enjoy a lot of active activities like football, walks, running, cycling. So you, you like doing things. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Okay. Anything that can keep me active. Okay, and what got you into ministry? Um, do you know what? It's a it's a good question. I um I remember going to Army Bible Camp you know, many years ago. I think it was 2013 or sometime around there, 2012. Um, and I remember praying after that, like Lord, however you want to use me, Bible studies, preaching, or whatever else. And I don't like um, talking in public or anything else like that. And so I was like, Lord, I'm putting myself out here. And every time the Lord just presented opportunities where people have just asked, oh, Nuri, can you do this? Can you do that? Mm -hmm. That's basically it. Wow. Okay. Praise God. Well, we thank you that you did that. You went through that experience so you could be here today um, to share with us. So my last question um, before you go into the word is if you had a luxury yacht. Now, if you have a luxury yacht already, great, amazing. <laughs> but if you could have one, uh, what would you name it? Um, I would name it Peace. Hmm. I think, you know, if you're on a, on a yacht and it's a luxury yacht, hopefully you'll be able to get some peace mm -hmm. out in the open. So, yeah, peace. Oh, that's a nice name. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I will let you um, lead us into our worship hour. Thank you. Um, so, happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, as Olivia said there, my name is Nori Masoud. I come from Manchester. Um, and it's a privilege to be with you today, uh, to be able to spend time with you and, and share God's word with you. It's always an honor um, to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, our message for today is entitled The Gospel and Me. The Gospel and Me. Uh, before we go any further, if you could just bow your heads with me for a word of prayer and we'll jump straight into the message. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would... Um, that you would be with us now, that you would send your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, speak through me and to me. And I pray that anything that would be stopping this from taking place, you would remove it right now. Lord, I pray that the, the gospel um, would make the appeal now that anybody that has heard or experienced the gospel, but is it's being held back in their lives for one reason or another, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see that today and that we would put all of those things to one side and focus on you and what you're asking us to do. So Lord, please be with us, give an experience with you and guide us in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The word gospel is mentioned in the Bible 77 times, often referenced with the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God and the gospel of the kingdom. The word gospel is taken from the Greek word euanglion, or I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure, but that's how I pronounce it. 
And it comes from the word good tidings or good news. And I believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, that Paul summarizes this gospel message well. He says that this message that was first delivered to me, I'm now sharing with you, that Christ died for the sins, for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, I know of no other religion that, or faith that tells of someone that died for the world's sins, both yours and mine. And not only that, but that somebody would not only die for the world's sins, but would have the power to take up their life again after three days. That someone is Jesus Christ. And because he left the course of heaven and came to this imperfect world, but lived a perfect life, we have the promise of eternal life. You see, the Bible talks about some bad news. That's why I like the Bible. It doesn't hold anything back. There's stories of people it could have refrained certain parts from it, but it doesn't. It exposes it all. And the bad news of the Bible, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And that the wages of sin is death. And um, that as a result of this, um, of what we, of, because of our sin, we will die. Romans 6, verse 23. But the Bible is filled with good news. It says that, well, Christ, uh, but God demonstrated his love for us. And that while we are still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5. And that the gospel of Christ is the power of God for salvation, Romans chapter 1. And this belief in Christ will see you inherit eternal life, John chapter 3. And guess what? It's free of charge. It's not by any of our works. It's by grace through faith that we're saved. So we can't boast, Ephesians chapter 2. You see, you don't have to bring anything to the table when it comes to the gospel. You just have to accept it. And so I believe that when you truly receive the gospel message, it should do something to our lives. It should make some kind of impact. Some form of sustaining change should take place. Some form of forgiveness given, even if you don't feel like it. Wrongs made right. Our characters developed. You see, you never outgrow the gospel. As long as you're alive, you have a need for the gospel. And so this gospel message, when we truly accept it and allow, it, allow God into our lives, I believe it should do something to us in a good way. How do I know this? Because I have read and experienced the gospel message for myself. I have seen the truths, the prophetic evidence, the love of God lived out. You know, when I, was, when I grew up, I had no religious background or anything like that. I, I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. None of my, my mom or my dad didn't grow up to be Seventh-day Adventist. And none of my family, actually. And I grew up with a very open mind in the sense of the people I surrounded myself with, and my friends, the family and everything else, determined how I saw the world. And... On, on having this experience um, and having this open mind, I, I, I had no clue as to who God was, who Christ is, Christianity or anything like that. And I met my wife at college and she told me that she's a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought nothing of it at the time. I batted it away. And for some reason, don't ask me why, I asked for a copy of a Bible. You see, I was very superstitious. I used to think that if I did certain things or worse, wore certain things, that it would bring me good luck. And so I'm here and I'm thinking, well, I've heard a lot of things about the Bible. But why don't I have a copy of the Bible? I'll keep it in my bag and hopefully it will bring me some good luck. And so here I am with this Bible in my bag. And uh, I don't read this thing for a while. I just think that if I have it in my bag, this book will, will bring me some good luck, not realizing that the book doesn't contain the power, but the words in it. And so over a period of time, I, I couldn't sleep one night. And I remember uh, picking up this Bible out of the bag and just opening it up. And I remember Tanisha telling me that if you read the Bible, uh, start in the book of Matthew. And so I'm looking for Matthew. I find it and I start to read it. And over the next few weeks, I would continue reading this book. And the beautiful thing about it was what I was understanding who Christ was and is for myself. Not from what anyone else was telling me, but from reading the scriptures for myself. And you see, I'd grown up with the belief that you have to get everything we can from this world, that we'll put ourselves to the front and, and, and almost be selfish. And as I'm reading about Christ, I'm just realizing this, this, this man is perfect. That he's doing the opposite, saying words like, he who is first will be last and he who is last will be first. 
and how he would navigate situations where people were trying to frame him and do him wrong. And he would always come out of it in a way where his character only shined brighter, but he never sought to seek revenge against those people or do them any harm. And so as I'm reading this and getting to know Christ for myself, I get to the point where I realize that God loved me that much, not only to present his perfect sacrifice, which was Christ on the cross, but he loved me that much that he would allow me to choose if I wanted to accept it. But not only have I read and, and understood the gospel message for myself, I've also experienced it. I've experienced being broken at the thought of what Christ has done for me. I've experienced God change my mind and my life. I look back on my life and I, I, I realize that I had, it had the opportunity to take so many wrong turns and head off in a bad direction. How a young man has gone from only being interested in football, money, girls, nice cars, and all the things that this world tells you you should be striving towards and having a baby at 18 years old, to finding the love of his life, fathering a son I'm immensely proud of and having two beautiful daughters. You see, I always find it strange that I grew up in Manchester and yes, like Olivia said, I attend Manchester South Church. Um, and Manchester South Church is literally round the corner from where I grew up. And me and my mom, we used to go past that church every week on a Saturday, taking me to football, or go and see my nan or other places. And when we would drive past that church, we would see the women in their elaborate hats and the men in their suits. And we'd be like, there's so many weddings at that church. Every week there's a wedding at that church. It's so busy. Because we'd have no idea of the Sabbath. We had no idea of uh, God's love or God's law. And so when, I, when I've, I've been asked to preach at Manchester South Church and I'm standing on that pulpit looking out and I can see the road in the background with the cars, the gospel has took me from out there, from someone that was just driving past, having no idea of what was happening inside, to preaching about the message. So I've experienced the gospel in my life. I've experienced miracles that God has worked that nobody else can explain. Not a coincidence, but an experience with him, where he has come through for me. You see, the gospel has power. And when I first came into the church, and even still now, I love to hear and watch people's testimonies. It's like the same gospel message lived out in a completely different way. Now, the same gospel message of Jesus Christ, our Savior, living a perfect life and dying on the cross and being resurrected victorious has changed so many people's lives down the years. Even in the midst of injustice and difficulty, the gospel message has survived. But as much as, much as seeing people's lives changed by the gospel message in a positive way, it always captures my imagination why people have heard and at some point in their life accepted it, but never fully followed through with the gospel message in their life. And since I've begun reading the Bible and come to know God, this is something that has always captured my imagination. How is that they can have all the evidence of being around or experience miracles themselves, but yet they turn away from the gospel still? Wow. And so today we're going to look at three examples of this taking place. Um, the first one is going to be in Luke chapter 22 and verse 1. If you could go there with me in your Bibles, Luke chapter 22 and verse 1. Luke 22 and verse 1. About Judas. Luke 22 and verse 1, and it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. He went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. Here we read that the chief priests and scribes have been seeking for a way of how they can kill Jesus. All Jesus has been doing is ministering God's word, healing the sick, putting wrongs right, raising not only just one person from the dead, but three people from the dead. And these chief priests and scribes are looking for this way to kill Jesus. And, and the text says that Satan entered Judas, the disciple of Christ. Judas goes to these chief priests and, and scribes and he negotiates with them that he will portray Jesus for a sum of money. Now, this is the same Judas that saw the sick, the lame, the deaf, the blind come to Jesus from all different types of places. And I'm sure on countless occasions from all different places and be healed. This is the same Judas that saw the dead raised back to life. This is the same Judas who felt the evidence of Christ's power and recognized the teaching of Christ as superior than anything else that he'd ever heard in his life. 
Christ had even entrusted Judas to do the work of an evangelist and gave him the power to heal the sick. Judas had experienced the gospel message firsthand, experienced the power of God both visibly through his own life, experienced miracles, and was able to perform miracles himself. And so what's so interesting in this situation is that Judas is living out the gospel message, but yet his own life isn't being changed by it. And that's a sobering thought. He's living this message, but his own life is in conflict with it. The Desire of Ages says, he loved the great teacher and desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life, and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. But Judas did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Christ. He did not give up his worldly ambition or his love of money. You see, it says that Judas loved Christ. He had a desire for his character and life to be changed, and he understood that it was only through Christ that this could happen. But there was something else higher up on the list worldly ambition and a love for money. And so we have this clash. Judas wants his life changing by Christ. He loves Jesus and wants to follow him, but his ambitions for this world and love for money are getting in the way. And when you distill this thing down, I wonder how many of us are going through the same thing. We want to follow Jesus, want him to change us, want him to be present in our lives, want to be with him when he comes again, but there's something else. There's another priority higher up, whether that's business, position, a relationship, friends, work, university, whatever it might be, you fill in the blank. And so I just wonder if anyone today can recognize and, 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 and relate to this experience because I remember a time and there's been a number of times where this has happened in my life. But one in particular when I was at university and I decided to do a placement year at university. And so I go and I started my placement in July and after my first week on the Sabbath, me and my wife, we went to Aberdaran in Wales. And we were both baptized uh, in the sea there. And it was a great weekend. We come back on the Sunday and I go back to that placement year, uh, placement on, on the Monday. And towards the end of the day, I'm in the kitchen and I'm getting myself a drink. And I'm still the new guy, not really spoken to many people. And somebody walks into the kitchen and, you know, introduces himself to me. And he, we're, we're talking and conversating and everything else, and it's, it's going well. And then he asks me, what did you do at the weekend? Now, I'm sure, as, as we know, there's many different answers to that question. Some that involve talking about what's going on at church and some that don't. But me, I'm like, I, I got baptized. Not expecting this person to know anything about that. But I'm like, I got baptized. And he was like, really? I was like, yeah. And he said, what church? I said, the Seventh-day Adventist church. He was like, no way, my family is Seventh-day Adventist. I was like, wow. And we're talking and talking. I knew no one at this place, nobody. And um, I hadn't told this place about Sabbath. And so I said to him, do you think leaving early on a Friday when sunset comes earlier, do you think it will be a problem? And he was like, look, I'll be honest with you. I'm not keeping Sabbath myself. He was real and honest at the time. He wasn't keeping Sabbath. And he's like, so, but what I do know is it shouldn't be an issue and you should be able to talk with your line manager and it'll get sorted out. So I'm like, okay. So I'm praying about this thing and, and even still, after that conversation with that person, I'm still hesitant to tell my placement and his place of work about the Sabbath. Why? Because in my mind, if they said no, what would I do? Would I then choose to not keep the Sabbath and work? Or would I choose to, to continue doing what God has asked me to do? And keep the Sabbath with the, the chance that I may lose this job and fail my placement here. And so all of these things are running through my mind. And like I said, I joined in July. So I had a, a few weeks before the sun started to set early and those clocks go back. And I'm talking and, and Tanisha, my wife, is telling me, she's like, Nori, you need to say something. You need to tell them about Sabbath is getting close now. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I will, I will. But I didn't. And I'm praying to God and I'm being honest with God. I'm telling him, I'm, I'm saying, I want to keep your Sabbath. I want to do what's right. But Lord, I'm ashamed. I feel embarrassed. 
And if they say no, what am I going to do? You see, I was placing the world above him. Anyway, a few weeks later, I'm, I'm at my desk and um, the CEO of the company says to me, Nori, have you got a minute? I'm like, so, so I get up off my desk and he invites me into his office. As I walk into his office, that friend that I had I'd spoken to, um, his family were Adventists, was stood in the corner of the room, but just looking at the floor, he didn't make eye contact with me. So I'm thinking, what's going on? The CEO says, take a seat, we sit down at his desk. And he uh, gets straight to the chase. He's like, no, I heard you need to leave early on Fridays. I'm like, yeah, I do. And uh, I get brave now. So I'm starting to talk about the Sabbath. I'm saying, you know, I can make up the time in the week is Sabbath. So sunset to sunset, he's like, hey, no, don't worry about any of that. He's like, just leave whenever you need to. Just leave whenever you need to. I'm like, I'll make up the time in the week. He's like, no, no, you don't need to do any of that. He's like, on a Friday, just leave whenever you need to. And he reaches over and shakes my hand and say thank you to him. As I walk out the room, I look, and this person who is now my friend, he's still in the corner of the room just looking at the floor. And so I go back to my desk, and I'm thinking, what on earth just happened there? Later on in the day, I speak to that person, and I say to him, what, what took place? Why did you go in there and tell the CEO of the company about Harvard for me? And he was like, you know, one day I went home, and I was talking with my mom, and I got talking about you. And as we were talking, she told me to go into work and make sure that I don't work on Sabbath. His mom said to him, you make sure that that boy doesn't work on Sabbath. And so him being an Adventist, but not keeping Sabbath and never talked to his, to his workplace about Sabbath, goes into work and tells the, the CEO of the company that Nori, it's a boy out there, Nori, who needs to, who needs to um, leave early on Fridays for X, Y, Z reason. And I tell you, this, I tell you this because in life, there will come some crossroads where you have to make a decision for God or for this world. You see, I, did, I wanted to make a decision for God and I was honest and I was praying to him to find a way that that could take place. But in my heart, I wanted, I was still clinging to this world. And there will come times in your life where you can make a decision for God and things work out well in, from a worldly perspective as well. You benefit. But there should never be a time where we're choosing this world over God. Because if you make a decision not for God, whatever it is, it can eventually determine your direction and travel of life and become the ruling motive of your life. You see, for Judas, greed had become the ruling motive of his life. And the Zara of Ages says that through becoming the slave of one vice, he gave himself to Satan to be driven to any length. It was just one thing. Instead of fostering a love for Christ and his work, Judith fostered a love for money and greed. Sold our saviour, his saviour, to face death for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. The gospel and Judas. The next, as we move closer to the cross, the next person we'll be looking at is Caiaphas. Jesus is now being portrayed by Judas and he's been taken to Caiaphas, the high priest. And to show you how evil Caiaphas is, he's, he's trying to get all of these people to give false testimonies against Jesus, but none of these testimonies are stacking up. Everyone's testimonies are false. And so, and they're too vague, they're just not, it's just not doing it. But in the end, two people step forward and, and, and the, these testimonies match up and, and he says that, he said that he will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And in Matthew 26 and verse 62, as we pick this up, Matthew 26, verse 62, it says, and the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands. Here we have Caiaphas, the high priest, questioning Jesus. And all that he's wanted to do since Jesus came on the scene is have him killed to avoid losing his power and position. 
Caiaphas has heard the good news of Jesus. He's heard of Christ's miracles, his wisdom, his knowledge and the scriptures and all of these things. But instead of accepting the gospel message, Caiaphas' pride sees him work this thing up so much in his mind that he views Christ as his bitter rival, has bitter jealousy towards him. And so now he finally has Christ captured. But as Caiaphas looks at Jesus, he's taken aback by Christ's dignified and noble bearing. It says that a conviction came over Caiaphas so much so that when he looked at Christ, he said in his heart, this man is like God. He's the high priest of Israel. These children of Israel who are taught to have one God and only one God, the God of heaven. But when he looks at Christ, he's like, I'm seeing God. But as soon as he thinks it, he banishes the thought from his mind. You see, despite all this, Caiaphas questions Jesus himself to further the cause to get Jesus killed. And so he says, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus, knowing that when he opens his mouth now to answer this question, that his death is certain. And on hearing Christ's words, Caiaphas, the high priest, tears his clothes. You see, right there and then in his heart, Caiaphas was convicted that Jesus was the Messiah. The desire of ages says that the divinity of Christ flashed through his guise of humanity. And he tears his priestly uh, robe in a hide to act to hide his conviction. But in tearing his priestly robe, he has pronounced death upon himself. You see, in, in Leviticus chapter 10, Christ had told Moses that no priest was to render their garments. And if they did, it warranted death. But here the high priest is pronouncing death on Christ, the one who has only lived righteously, done nothing wrong, but lived his life in accordance with the scriptures and the law. And here Caiaphas goes against the very law he's trying to condemn Christ by, by tearing his robe. You see, the gospel was known to Caiaphas. He was convicted, but pride had got in the way. He was so set on being right and following this thing through, despite the truth being before his very eyes, that he couldn't accept it. You see, pride can cause you to be blind. It can cause you to assume a higher position with no foundation for it. Pride makes it easy to condemn others. Pride makes you feel like you're immune from certain sins or certain things that are wrong. Pride makes you harsher on the evil of others than you are on your own actions. You see, there's no pride in the gospel message, but humility in the gospel message. So many issues arise and the gospel message is held back from working with power in our lives because so many people that pride won't see them back down or apologize, or they're too busy pointing out the wrongs in other people's lives and being too judgmental. The book Steps to Christ says that the closer you come to Christ, the more faulty and imperfect you will become in your own eyes. But sometimes it feels like the opposite. The closer people can come to Jesus, the more they're pointing out the faults in other people's lives. That's not the case. You see, Caiaphas, Despite being convicted, the pride in his heart held the gospel message back. And like Caiaphas, are we doing the same in condemning ourselves? You see, the gospel message is one of humility, not one of pride. And so the gospel and Caiaphas. Now we come to the end. Jesus has been taken and nailed to the cross. But alongside him are two thieves who have been condemned to death. And we are told that both men who were crucified with Christ at first spoke out against him with abuse. But as one of the thieves becomes more desperate and defiant, the other stops and remembers all that he had heard and seen of Jesus. And instead of mocking Jesus, he recognizes Christ as his savior. Luke 23, verse 39. Luke 23, verse 39. We'll read these verses quickly. Luke 23, verse 39 says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Caiaphas said the same thing, If you are the Son of God. Here this thief is saying, If you are the Christ. The same words that Satan used in Matthew 4 and in the wilderness, If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Always questioning Jesus and his position. Saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
And so here you have one criminal who is rebelling against against Christ and another who is defending Jesus and recognizing him him as his savior. And both are being exposed to the same evidence. Both are being exposed to this gospel message, but the gospel is working in one of them and in the other it isn't. But when I read this story and I, I pondered on it, I was thinking, well, it's good that this thief is recognizing Christ as his savior now. But why is that the case? Why didn't he do this earlier in his life? Why did he make this decision to accept the gospel message before? And part of the reason when you read the Desire of Ages is that despite his convictions for the gospel message, he had been led astray by the people that he associated himself with. The people he surrounded himself with had caused him to take a different path in life. Not one that led to the gospel, but one that led him away from it. And if there's one thing I know, it's that who you surround yourself with can impact the direction of your life forever. You know, you may not think it, but those people that you surround yourself with can have this impact on your life. When I was younger, I was into a certain type of music. And all of my friends, we all like the same music. And we, uh, we, we started to travel to Leeds. And in Leeds, the, this music was, was, was often played and was like known to be a good place to, to go to. And so we would go to these places in Leeds um, and we went there in a particular year twice beforehand. And this is before I was, I was uh, exposed properly to the gospel message of giving my life to Christ. And we'd go to Leeds and everything went well and no, no issues and nothing like that. And so we were planning to go back again, but this time for New Year's. And so everyone's making plans to go, no different to the other time. We'll get a minibus, we'll all go to Leeds, and then we'll come back to Manchester that, that, that later that night. And I remember telling Tanisha, my wife, about this, and I was saying, look, I'm going to be going back to Leeds, everything else. And she was like, you know, I'd prefer if you didn't go. We'd not long just had um, Jade and our son, and she was saying to me, you know, it's his first Christmas, and it'll be his first New Year's, why don't you just stay home? And I'm weighing this thing up in my mind. I'm like, hmm, I was still very young and immature. And uh, all I can say is listen to your wife. Listen to your wife. When she tells you something, listen to your wife. And uh, I, I decided at quite last minute to drop out and not go. And my friends, they all went. And the night was going just as it normally would. And then somebody got involved in a bit of a kerfuffle. And things started to to break out and things started to happen, which weren't good. And one of my friends in particular did something that none of my other friends were expecting them to do. Which meant that a few weeks later, the police all got involved. And there was a CCTV footage and everything else. And those friends that had gone out on that evening, they all went to jail for a significant period of time. Now, if I was there and my, my friends, we weren't bad guys. We just wanted to have a good time. But if I was there, I would have ended up in jail and I don't think I'd be stood talking to you through my laptop right now. And so I praise God that I didn't go that evening because my life would have taken a completely different turn and headed on in a different direction. And so you might not think it, but the company you keep at school, college, university, work, the relationships you keep, and that you're engaged in and change the direction of your life. You see, this thief, he had accepted the gospel early in his life, but those people that he surrounded himself with pushed him away from it. You know, as I, one time I was in, um, at work and I had got to know somebody there quite well, uh, where I used to work previously, and I'd introduced him to, he'd moved up from London, so I introduced him to a few of my friends, people from church, uh, family, etc., and we came close. And he told me that he he got engaged to his uh, partner, and they were planning a wedding. And then one day he asked me if I could if I had a few minutes. And so I came. We were upstairs in work at, in in a, a kitchen area, and he's telling me, "Oh, I planned the, we planned the wedding, and we've set a date." And I'm like, "All right, okay." And he's like, "I'd like you to come along." And in my mind, I'm already anticipating what I'm going to have to say because most times or not, these weddings are on Sabbath. 
And he says to me, he says, Nori, I've looked at the um, sunset. It's going to be on Saturday, but I've already looked at some of the sunset times and I've saved two spaces for you and Tanisha at the reception because the, the reception will start just after sunset so you can come so whenever you need to, but you'll make it for the meal. There'll be a space for you to be there. Come whenever you can. And me, I was taken so aback that this guy, he's not an Adventist, he's not a Christian, has different beliefs to me. But he understood and respected my beliefs, so much so that he had done that research already, knowing that I keep the Sabbath. They're the type of people that you need around you. Not ones that always think the same way as you, might not have the same beliefs as you, but they respect you for who you are. They respect and encourage you. And I'll never forget that. And so this thief obviously clearly didn't have people like that in his life. But now he's on the cross, he's facing the end of his life. And we see this gospel summarized in a beautiful way. Verse 42 says that then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, in, Ju uh, in Jesus, bruised, mocked and hanging upon the cross the thief sees the lamb of god that takes away the sin of the world sda bible commentary says hanging upon the cross christ was the gospel at the time when jesus would appear his most helpless at the time when no one else acknowledged the savior while he hung upon the cross dying despite everyone else around the repentant thief doubting christ despite his past Despite Jesus facing the same death as him, he recognizes Christ as his Lord. Not just his Savior, but his Lord. And where he used to be influenced by everyone else around him, now the only influence he wants in his life is Christ. He recognizes that only through Christ's righteous life can he be saved to the heavenly kingdom. He recognizes that Christ is on the cross, not because of anything Jesus has done, but because of everything he has done. And Christ didn't take long to think about that thief's decision. Quickly, he responded with the words of love. You see, Christ had only heard mocking up until that point, only heard words of doubt from those around him, but the thief on the cross called him Lord. You see, the gospel and the thief. You see, the gospel has power. It's a powerful message that has the impact to, to change our lives in a way that's, that can be unexplainable but it can often be held back from working in our lives with the power that God wants it to you see for Judas it was money and greed for Caiaphas it was pride spiritual pride for the thief it was his associations what is it for you what about the gospel and you is there something that's stopping this gospel message from being lived out in your life when you reflect and think Yes, you may accept the gospel message, but is it truly working in your life the way that you know God wants it to? Is sustaining change taking place? And I'm not talking about things changing for a week because you heard a message. I'm talking about your life changing from now until he comes. Is forgiveness being demonstrated in your life even when you don't feel like it? Are wrongs being made right? Is your character being developed? Is the gospel impacting your life? The question for, for me and you today is what about the gospel and me? What about the gospel and me? You see, my prayer today is that we would sit and we would think and we would recognize what God wants to do in our lives and allow him to do it. Allow this gospel message in. Allow him to transform us and make us ready for when he comes. Amen. Let's just, uh, let's just bow our head for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we can come together and explore your word. This time where we can ponder on the example of those that have gone before us. Help us if anybody today is, is focused too heavily on this world from a um, financial, greed, material gain perspective, Lord, speak to their hearts. Help them to learn from Judas. Help them to put those things to one side and to focus on you and keep your eyes on you and you will bless them. You will look after their needs and you will guide them. I pray that if anybody 
uh, listening today is, has been suffering with pride and been building things up in their mind and thinking they're right all of the time and failing to take your advice and take a step back and learn from your character. I pray that you would speak to their heart. And Lord, I pray that if we know that the people around us are pulling us away from you, bringing us into conversation, bringing us into areas of our life that distract us or pull us into a direction which is leading away from your kingdom, I pray that you would prick our consciences and that you would help us to make a stand for you. Lord, may we be witnesses for you, through your gospel being lived out through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I don't know about anybody else, uh, but I found that very, very refreshing. Um, it, it's so incredible to hear and appreciate your journey and the so many changes that have happened over the past few years for you. Your whole life has been turned completely upside down um, and gone in a direction that obviously you didn't even envision you having at an earlier age. And I think it's incredible that you are here before us, like you said, um, to be able to share this message. Um, I, I'm sure this will not be the last time that we hear from you. I'm sure there'll be plenty of other churches who will be listening in um, that will want to have you um, preaching and doing different preaching appointments from, especially just from this. Um, like I said, I definitely, definitely appreciate um, your message today. Like you said, the, that, that last question, I think you said, what about the gospel and me? Um, it, we, I guess we sometimes get so focused on others around us and what it's doing for them. And, and But what about you? What, what does it mean to you? What's your journey? What are you here to leave when, when mm. you, because when we we're all going to pass at some point, what is your legacy? Um, what are people going to remember you by? What will you have done for Christ? Um, so yeah, what about the gospel and me? Um, thank you so much, Nuri, for um, your message today. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So as we just take this time um, to just reflect on the words that we've heard from Nuri, um, let's just think on who, who you are. Who do you surround yourself with? Who do you have around you that is impacting your life and your journey? Who do you want around you? Is Christ in that? Is he, is he dwelling with you? Do you take him with you every day? Have a moment to just reflect. Thank you once again to Nuri. I hope that you have been blessed uh, by that powerful message today. Um, I definitely have. And it's, like I said, so refreshing um, for a young preacher, um, married to three children, um, to share his, his testimony and shared a word, a word with us today. Um, so I'm just going to close our whole morning service. I hope that you have been blessed, like I said, um, and we'll go into our announcements. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we are just so thankful for um, the, from the Sabbath school um, right through, Lord, you have blessed us. We thank you for the message that we have heard today and all the things that we have learned throughout um, our fellowship this morning. I pray that it stays on our hearts and our minds and that we take this with us to share to others, but also to reflect on our own lives, to transform our lives, to change our lives, to mould our characters so that we become more like you. I pray for the rest of the day and I hope that it's fruitful for all. I pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So before you go, 
just two announcements. I think maybe three today. I'm not sure. Let's see. Announcements for today. Our good old book club. It's been there since the start and it's continuing our book club. Our book for this week. I don't know if it's been previous weeks, but so far, this is the book today. This week will be the meaning of marriage. So if you've missed a couple, you can just crack on this week until Thursday. So that's Thursday, every Thursday, seven to eight. And that's the meaning of marriage uh, by Timothy Keller. Maybe a good read. I should probably join at some point. I haven't yet, but I will try and join this week. We'll see. <laughs> But join us on Thursday, 7 to 8. And our other announcement is podcasts. We announced this last week. We've been doing podcasts for a while. If you didn't know, you can find your sermons, workshops, devotionals, real talks, Bible studies, weeks of prayer on your phone, on your devices to be able to listen to. I don't know about anybody else, but I definitely enjoy listening to podcasts on the way to work rather than just music all the time, even at the gym, um, rather than having to look at the screen, you just have it on in your ear, you're going for a nice walk, maybe you're just on the way to, maybe to school, maybe to work, maybe anywhere you're going, a podcast is there just for you. So yes, all our sermons and workshops and such are on uh, our podcast platform. If you would like any further details, please um, contact us on the social media platforms, but you can see there, you can listen on, I don't know what these icons are. Okay, I don't know what the first one is. I'm not sure what the second one is, but the third one is Spotify. So you can definitely listen on Spotify. <laughs> I'm sure the first one is like the podcast platform for, for Apple, maybe. I don't know. Either way, if you'd like to find out some more information, you can contact us on our social media platforms. I don't think there are any more announcements for today, but the only last announcement I would say is have a wonderful day. Go for a walk have a good drink, have some good food and be blessed guys. Take care. Bye.